Well, good morning, West End. My name is John Bourgeois, and I'm one of the pastors here. Um, warm welcome to you if this is your first Sunday joining us. Um, right now, we are in the middle of a nine-week series called The Life of Love, and uh, we're doing this. Why are, we, why are we in a series called The Life of Love? Uh, we're in a series called The Life of Love because right now in our cultural moment, nothing requires love of us. Like savvy, yes skill, maybe ability to perform to others' expectations, yes, but love, no, nothing. Nothing requires love of us, and yet at the same time, nothing is needed more than love. So together, we've been asking for the past few weeks, what might it look like? What might God have for us as a church? What might it look like to learn again afresh to walk in love together? And so this week, we are going to be looking at this passage in Paul's letter to the, book, to the church in Ephesus um, about truth and love and ask this question, how can this passage from Ephesians help us to learn to walk together in love? So I invite you now to stand um, with me for the reading of God's word. Uh, God's word is trustworthy and true, and he gives it to us in love. So here now from Ephesians 4, starting in verse 13. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Uh, Our great God, we uh, thank you for being here with us by your spirit. We ask now that by that same spirit, you would attend to your word um, and us. Lord, would you uh, awaken us and aliven us to you that we might see Jesus and be transformed by him. To your glory we pray. Amen. Um, This week, I read the story of a man named Chris Allen. Um, Chris, a few years ago, caught strep throat, and after he recovered, he had this lingering fatigue, and he reasoned that it was a combination of the exhaustion that came from having a new baby and from the bleakness of a Minnesota winter, and yet he just, keep, he just kept getting weaker and weaker, and he began even to have difficulty lifting his newborn daughter, and by that spring, his vision had started to go. He was seeing double. He had to use a cane and a wheelchair to get around, and nobody knew what was wrong. Chris and his wife, Alicia, watched as their newborn daughter gained weight, and she reached milestones, and meanwhile, Chris was just withering away. He kept getting sicker and sicker. He had to take medical leave from his job. He said that his pain was so bad it would keep him up at night, only getting one or two hours of sleep. And then um, anything, walking exhausted him, and his days were just moving from the couch to the bedroom or couch to the bathroom or back, and he said going outside was difficult. He said even the sun hurt. And over the next 18 months, the Allens, Chris and his wife Alicia, went on this medical odyssey with diagnostic tests and visiting specialists. First they thought it was MS, and then heart issues, and maybe it was cancer or tumors, He got tested for all of these, and it was none of them. So doctors prescribed physical therapy for him um, uh, to address this loss of mobility he had, and he failed. He said he failed physical therapy three times, nearly fainting from the exhaustion that the therapy required. And eventually, his medical record would, would be 300 pages long, including results from hundreds of lab tests. He said that anything, anytime he did anything that involved physical, mental, or emotional stress, he would crash and he'd be wiped out for several weeks. So almost a year after his bout with strep throat, a doctor in another state heard about his condition and offered to see him. So he flew from Minnesota to Utah, visited this doctor, and this doctor encouraged him to go to see a well-known endocrinologist at the Mayo Clinic. So he went to the Mayo Clinic, he was given a battery of tests, And then the doctor there suggested that he have a treatment of a combination of growth hormones. um, And that he would, so he started injecting himself nightly with a synthetic human growth hormone. And the doctors later said, like, they really didn't think it would make much difference, but it was worth a shot. So he begins his treatment, and within one week, he's walking around the house without help. Within a month, he could run a mile. 
and now his body is working, it's restored, and it's functioning properly. After 18 months of searching for answers, doctors finally found out what was wrong. His body wasn't producing the growth hormones that he required to live. So why do I tell you this story? If a body is not growing, it's dying. Chris Allen's body was wasting away because it was not producing the growth hormone that was required for him to live. In our passage this morning, Paul compares the church to a body, and he says that in order for the church to grow, it needs a particular growth hormone. And if the church is not growing, it's dying. I'm not talking about money and programs, people building campaigns, but talking about growing in depth of our life with God and with one another. If the church is not growing, it's dying. In this passage, Paul says the church has a problem. Our problem is immaturity, that we need to grow into full maturity. And God's means of doing this, the growth hormone for the church, he says, is speaking the truth in love. So we're going to look at these three verses together, these four verses together, and we're going to, here's my outline. Our need for growth, the means of growth, and the goal of the growth. So the need, the means, and the goal of growth. So first, the need. Um, so we're, we're dropping in mid-thought for Paul here. And um, what's going on is, is Paul is explaining, his, he's explaining God's purposes for the church. And for, in this section of his letter to the church in Ephesus, he's telling the church how God desires for her to grow um, and how also God provides for this growth. In verse 14, he uses a couple of illustrations, uh, a couple of images to show us, to show the church's need for growth. Um, If you look at verse 14 with me, he says, Then we will no longer be infants tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind. And so Paul's describing the experience of immaturity or infancy as being like a small, rudderless, anchorless boat. Right? And in the Mediterranean Sea, you can imagine that a small, anchorless, rudderless boat would get tossed around by the wind and the waves. And Paul is saying, in our immaturity, in the church's immaturity, two things toss us about. Every wind of teaching and cunningness and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. So what is he talking about? Paul is saying that in our infancy, in our immaturity, we are persuaded by two things. Truth without love and love without truth. Now, truth without love is not actually truth, and love without truth is not actually love, but we are tricked and we are tossed about so easily. Let me ask you this. Over the past six years, have you read something online or seen something on TV that persuaded you that you were right and that they, whoever they may be, that they were wrong, and then you got mad, you got self-righteous about it? I mean, I know I have. But an authentic encounter with the truth does not lead to self-righteousness. It leads to humility. And on the other side, over the same period of time, have you thought or said or done anything because somebody flattered you with their words, puffed you up, and then led you astray? And then when you figured out what happened, you felt small and ashamed and insecure. I know this has happened to me. But an authentic encounter with love does not lead us into shame or insecurity, but it leads to courage and boldness. Y'all, we are so quick to receive love without truth or truth without love. And Paul says that we are immature and we need to grow up. And it's not just that we're pushed around, but in our immaturity, we do the pushing too. All of us have a bent. Like some of us are people pleasers. Others of us are people judgers. People pleasers avoid speaking the truth on the basis of not wanting to hurt another person. But in reality, we're just scared of risking further hurt ourselves and we're just terrified of taking that risk. People, judges, justify their interference by claiming that the other person really needs to hear what they have to say, and they want to pass judgment on another and put them in their place. And God's answer to our immaturity is the growth hormone truth and love. So notice Paul's response to this reality. The answer isn't to take your boat out of the water to withdraw from the world or from the church and community, but to grow a rudder and to put down an anchor. Paul says that the antidote to being pushed around is to grow up, to put on your big boy pants and grow up. Um, When Mary Clark and I moved to Winston-Salem seven years ago to do RUF at Wake Forest, uh, we came in one weekend in order to buy a house, and we viewed a, a bunch of houses and 
We looked and we looked and then we were just paralyzed in our indecision because there, you know, there was no perfect house. And so we're at, um, we were staying with our pastor there, staying with he and his wife, and we were in their den that evening of looking around, and he said the most compassionate words that we could have heard. He said, y'all need to grow up. Put on your big boy pants, put on your big girl pants, and grow up. Make a decision and do it together. That was, that was what we needed to hear in love. And Paul is saying the same thing to the church, exactly what the church needs to hear. Grow up. How? Take the growth hormone, truth given in love. And before we talk about truth and love, we need to define these words together. So love, as I've defined before from J.I. Packer, love is the desire and effort to make another person great. And great meaning everything that God intends for him or her to be. And truth, writes Dallas Willard, truth is that which corresponds to reality. And reality is what you bump into when you're wrong. So, for example, um, if I say that my gas tank is full, you can go check my gas gauge and find out whether or not I'm telling the truth. Truth is verifiable, right? It's different from belief. If I ran out of gas on the way here this morning, but really believed that I had a full tank of gas, right, that wouldn't get me here. But if I went and grabbed a couple of friends and together we started a movement, a political movement, gas in the tank, and our political movement sweeps the nation, believing that there is gas in the tank doesn't make it true, right? Facts and beliefs are different things. Facts correspond to reality. Reality is what you bump into when you're wrong. And the Christian faith rests on an astounding truth claim, that the man, Jesus of Nazareth, died, completely dead, and three days later was raised from the dead. And that this man made all sorts of claims about who he was, who we are, what life is about, and how we're to live as humans. But the truth claim of the Christian faith is simple, that the tomb was empty. And that is the most important truth claim that every human must wrestle with and grapple with in their lives. And so when Paul says truth and love, what he's saying is that truth and all of the truths that flow from it. All of those, that truth is to be communicated in a manner that is aimed at the ultimate good of another. Paul is saying that this is the growth hormone for the body of Christ. This is the thing that makes the body grow up from infancy to adulthood, from immaturity to maturity. It's the truth and love. And he's saying this into the reality of the church. And the reality of the church is that we are all messy people. I mean, like the church, that's what the church is. We are an island of misfit toys. I I think Carter says this to us probably every week. He's right, right? Don't be fooled by each other. We're all messy. We're this gloriously beautiful mess. We're both rapture and rupture, both glory and garbage. And we work so hard to pretend that this is not true. I mean, think about how you answer the question, how are you? How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? Um, Joe Novenson, who's a pastor in... Chattanooga says that fine is an acronym for freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. We all do this, right? We, we're all messy people, and God calls us, he calls you and me to be a part of each other's growth. Speaking the truth and love happens in the midst of the mess, our real lives as we actually live them. It's not just for leaders, it's not just for those who are in full-time ministry, for pastors or elders, counselors, but for all of us. If you are a Christian, this is your calling too. God wants to use you, even in the midst of your mess, to speak loving truth into the lives of other messy people. And the truth must always be given in love. The one who was raised for us requires it. Truth without love and love without truth just don't work. I heard it said that loving someone without truth is like being a bad Uber driver. All right, bear with me. All right, so it's like being a driver who is meticulous about the comfort of his passengers, but he doesn't have any navigation skills or knowledge of the city he's driving in, right? So you make sure that the temperature of the car is just right, and you put on the passenger's favorite music, you offer bottled water for the trip, but then you spend 30 minutes simply wandering around the streets of the city and end up dropping the passenger off miles away from their destination. 
Y'all, that's what happens when we fall into the trap of loving others without speaking truth. We end up just wandering aimlessly. That's what happens when we're kind and polite and caring and compassionate, but we fail to bring the truth of the gospel and of God to bear. The truth of God and the message of the gospel are the only things that can provide true hope and joy and peace and transformation in the midst of our messes. To act lovingly towards someone but withhold what they desperately need isn't real love. We can't build one another up through niceness or well wishes. So a question you have to ask yourself, that we need to ask ourselves, do we love others enough to courageously and lovingly speak the truth? Now on the other hand, speaking truth without love can also be compared to being a bad Uber driver just in a little different way. It's like being a driver who knows exactly where to go, but you have no interest in your passenger's safety or comfort. So you pick up your passenger in your beat up 1973 El Camino that's filled to the roof with fast fill garbage, so they have to sit in the open back with no seats or seat belts. Your passenger hops in only to find a three week old deer carcass and a month's worth of empty beer cans while you take off racing down the street and squealing your tires at every turn. And when you arrive at their destination, you discover that your passenger hopped out miles ago at a stoplight because it was just too much. You may have arrived at the destination, but you failed to bring your passenger along with you. Y'all, this is what it feels like when we throw our favorite Bible verses around at people without considering what it is that they actually need. As Americans, we have the right to use our tongue however we wish. But if you belong to Jesus, you are a citizen of his kingdom, and you have a responsibility to use your tongue for the love of God and the love of your neighbor. As Christians, our rights must always be submitted to our responsibilities to love. There are a lot of de-churched people in our city, our neighbors and coworkers and friends, who are convinced that the biblical truth just doesn't work. Not because they have a problem with the truth, but because the truth wasn't communicated in love. Right? This also happens when we speak the truth, but we don't show this truth through our sacrificial actions. Messy people need more than just truth spoken to them. Right? We need it lived out for us. And this phrase translated speaking the truth here is actually one word in the original language. It's like truthing. Paul is... His call here is for us to literally to be truthing one another in love. Yes, it's speaking the truth, but it's so much more. And this is where we get the phrase, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Um, to give you an example of this, one of the hardest truths in the Bible, um, one of the ones maybe most difficult for us to accept, to talk about, to, to sh joyfully share with our neighbors, is the reality of hell. And do you know who talks about hell more than any other person in Scripture? Jesus. The most compassionate human in history had the most to say about the realities of life apart from a relationship with the loving God. Tim Keller, in his book on marriage, says that love without truth is sentimentality. It supports and it affirms us, but it keeps us in denial about our flaws and truth without love is just harshness. It may give us information, but in such a way that we can't really hear it. And if you're, if you're not a Christian and you're here with us this morning, I hope you hear that the conversation that we're having as a church is like, we're not great at this. We know it, but we serve a God who does this perfectly. The love of God in Christ is marked by both a radical truthfulness about who we are he had also this radical, unconditional commitment to not leave us. God tells us the hard truth about who we are, and yet he refuses to let us go. As Jack Miller would say, cheer up, you are far more sinful than you could ever imagine. And cheer up, you are more loved in Christ than you could ever hope or dream. And when this truth, clothed in love, makes its way deep, deep, deep down into our souls, it strengthens us to see the truth about ourselves and to repent, to turn from ourselves to Christ, who is truth and love perfected. So the need for growth, we're infants, 
tossed around in our immaturity. The means of growth, this growth hormone, truth and love, and finally the goal of growth. What is the goal of growth? Paul says in verse 13 that the goal of all this is that we would grow up and be mature. And then he clarifies this in 15 and 16 and says that what he's talking about is that we would grow up into Christ, who is the head of the body. And here Paul is using this, using human growth as the metaphor for what God is doing in the church. And maturity, being grown up in Christ, is our goal. So why? Like, why is this, why is this the goal? I just finished reading this fantastic book um, by a man named Alan Noble, and the book is called You Are Not Your Own. And in this book, he states that in our modern society, our view of humanity, our anthropology, is fundamentally flawed because it is rooted in this lie. You are, you are your own, and you belong to yourself. And what he says is that self-belonging provides a massive burden to figure out your own identity and your own truth and your own authenticity. And the demand of authenticity is that you have to figure this out for yourself without any reference to anyone else or anything external. And the pressure to discover and to live my truth is crushing. Noble writes that our society incentivizes us to not be human. So no matter how much we belong to Jesus, we feel this tug, this anxiety of living in and resisting this culture. And that this goes on, it stunts our imagination. Like it stunts our our, our ability to conceive a way out or to imagine a different way of living. And so what we do is we survive. Survival is all we do. We just have to get through the day or just make it through And so what we do is we turn to techniques. We look to new tools and techniques to distract us, to help us get through. And we're so conditioned by this that when we're confronted with something like speaking the truth in love, we think, that's it. That's the thing I need to get my life back on track. That's my new technique. If I start doing that, then I'll grow. Then I'll be self-actualized. Then I'll finally grow up. But when we look at it this way, it's just another technique, just another tool in the exhausting pursuit of you becoming a better you. But friends, the good news of the gospel is that you are not your own, but you belong to Jesus. And God is growing you up into Christ. Not you by yourself, but y'all, us together. Why? Because we belong to him And him growing us up together brings him glory. I'm going to close with this. Um, I heard a story recently about a painting. And up until a few years ago, this painting was owned by a family in Louisiana. The dad owned a small sheet metal shop in Baton Rouge. And he inherited the parenting from an uncle who ran a furniture business in New Orleans who'd passed away a few years earlier. And so the uncle had, had bought this painting when he went to Europe in the 50s. He uh, went to an estate sale on vacation. Sounds like a great idea. Um, and he bought it for 120 bucks. And he brought it back and he hung it in his house. And then when he passed on, he, he uh, passed it on to his nephew um, who owned the, the scrap metal business. And then when they died, um, their, one of their children um, put it up, uh, had, a, had another estate sale and um, they sold the painting to an art collector for like $1,200. Like 10 times what they bought it for. That's a pretty good deal. So the art dealers had this painting cleaned, and the person who cleaned it realized something incredible. That this painting that had been picked up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, might be worth more than $1,200. So they spent the next few years validating this, and it turns out that the painting that had been bought in Europe for $120 and sold at a, a few decades later at a state sale for $1,200 was a long-lost masterpiece of Leonardo da Vinci. It had been painted by one of the greatest minds in history. It had been owned by royalty. Right? There's currently only like 15 pieces by da Vinci still in existence. Last year, this painting sold to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia for $450 million. <laughs> In case you're wondering, that's 375,000 times more than what the family in Louisiana sold it for. The grandniece of the uncle who had the sheet metal business said that this was hard to absorb. (laughs) Do you know what it means when your family heirloom sells for half a million dollars, half a billion dollars to the crown prince of Saudi Arabia? It means you're not getting it back. 
Friends, the beauty of the gospel is that God has watched us sell our glory for next to nothing, for achievement, for money, for sex, to feel like we're in control when in really no one has that much control. We've sold our glory, but in Christ, the God of glory has bought us back. We sold a masterpiece for nothing, but instead of you losing everything, God has given it all back as a gift by giving his son for you. Being a Christian is like having someone hand you paints and a brush and says, and they say, paint a self-portrait, but instead of looking in a mirror, you look at Christ. You look at him and you watch him. He who is truth and love perfected, and you paint on the canvas of your life what you see in him. And over time, what you've done is you've painted Jesus onto the canvas of your own life. And part of the miracle of God's grace is that you won't just have watched the full-grown, mature man, Jesus, but you will have been conformed to the full-grown, mature man, Jesus. This is an invitation. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you that you see us in our infancy and our immaturity and you long for us to grow up into maturity. And so you give us Jesus, who is the perfection of truth and love, and you apply his work to us by your spirit to grow us up. And Lord, we ask for your help. Help us. Help us to become more and more uh, people who look like Jesus um, by you doing this work of applying your grace to us. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.